In the Scottish canon, to be placed alongside Robert Burns is high praise indeed, but it's a rightful place for one of Scotland's finest novelists. Born in 1850, he managed to cram much into his 44 years, travelling widely to France, the United States, Samoa and the South Seas. Of course, he is widely fated for his classics, Dr Jekyll and Mr Hyde, Treasure Island and poetry volumes such as A Child's Garden of Verses. This volume centres on his short stories. These are somewhat dark, bringing a chill to the air and a race to the heart. So sit back and let Richard Midgley and Robbie McNabb bring every word to your waiting ears. The Body Snatcher by Robert Louis Stevenson Every night in the year, four of us sat in the small parlour of the George at Debenham, the undertaker and the landlord and Fetty's and myself. Sometimes there would be more, but blow high, blow low, come rain or snow or frost, we four would be each planted in his own particular armchair. Fetty's was an old drunken Scotsman, a man of education, obviously, and a man of some property, since he lived in idleness. He had come to Debenham years ago while still young, and by a mere continuance of living had grown to be an adopted townsman. His blue camlet cloak was a local antiquity, like the church spire. His place in the parlour at the George, his absence from church, his old, crapulous, disreputable vices, were all things, of course, in Debenham. He had some vague radical opinions, and some fleeting infidelities which he would now and again set forth and emphasise with tottering slaps upon the table. He drank rum, five glasses regularly every evening, and for the greater portion of his nightly visit to the George sat, with his glass in his right hand, in a state of melancholy alcoholic saturation. We called him the Doctor, for he was supposed to have some special knowledge of medicine and had been known upon a pinch to set a fracture or reduce a dislocation. But beyond these slight particulars, we had no knowledge of his character and antecedents. One dark winter night, it had struck nine some time before the landlord joined us. There was a sick man in the George, a great neighbouring proprietor, suddenly struck down with apoplexy on his way to Parliament, and the great man's still greater London doctor had been telegraphed to his bedside. It was the first time that such a thing had happened in Debenham, for the railway was but newly open, and we were all proportionately moved by the occurrence. "'He's come,' said the landlord, after he had filled and lighted his pipe. "'He?' said I. "'Who? Not the doctor?' "'Himself,' replied our host. "'What is his name?' "'Dr Macfarlane.' said the landlord. Fetis was far through his third tumbler, stupidly fuddled, now nodding over, now staring mazily around him. But at the last word he seemed to awaken and repeated the name Macfarlane twice, quietly enough the first time, but with sudden emotion at the second. Yes, said the landlord, that's his name, Dr Wolf Macfarlane. Fetis became instantly sober. His eyes awoke, his voice became clear, loud and steady, his language forcible and earnest. We were all startled by the transformation, as if a man had risen from the dead. "'I beg your pardon,' he said. "'I'm afraid I've not been paying much attention to your talk. Who is this Wolf Macfarlane?' And then, when he had heard the landlord out, "'It cannot be. It cannot be,' he added. "'And yet I would like well to see him face to face.' "'Do you know him, Doctor?' asked the undertaker with a gasp. "'God forbid!' was the reply. "'And yet the name is a strange one. "'It were too much to fancy, too. "'Tell me, landlord, is he old?' "'Well,' said the host, "'he's not a young man, to be sure, "'and his hair is white, but he looks younger than you. "'He is older, though, years older. "'But,' with a slap upon the table, it's the rum you see in my face, rum and sin. This man, perhaps, may have an easy conscience and a good digestion. Conscience! Hear me speak. You would think I was some good old decent Christian, would you not? But no, not I. I never canted. Voltaire might have canted if he'd stood in my shoes. But the brains, with a rattling fillip on his bald head, the brains were clear and active, 
and I saw and made no deductions. If you know this doctor, I ventured to remark after a somewhat awful pause, I should gather that you do not share the landlord's good opinion. Fettis paid no regard to me. Yes, he said with sudden decision. I must see him face to face. There was another pause, and then a door was closed rather sharply on the first floor, and a step was heard upon the stair. That's the doctor, cried the landlord. Look sharp and you can catch him. It was but two steps from the small parlour to the door of the old George Inn. The wide oak staircase landed almost in the street. There was room for a turkey rug and nothing more between the threshold and the last round of the descent. But this little space was every evening brilliantly lit up, not only by the light upon the stair and the great signal lamp below the sign, but by the warm radiance of the barroom window. The George thus brightly advertised itself to passers-by in the cold street. Fettis walked steadily to the spot, and we, who were hanging behind, beheld the two men meet, as one of them had phrased it, face to face. Dr Macfarlane was alert and vigorous. His white hair set off his pale and placid, although energetic, countenance. He was richly dressed in the finest of broadcloth and the whitest of linen, with a great gold watch-chain and studs and spectacles of the same precious material. He wore a broad-folded tie, white and speckled with lilac, and he carried on his arm a comfortable driving coat of fur. There was no doubt that he became his years, breathing as he did of wealth and consideration, and it was a surprising contrast to see our parlour sot, bald, dirty, pimpled and robed in his old camlet cloak, confront him at the bottom of the stairs. Macfarlane, he said somewhat loudly, more like a herald than a friend. The great doctor pulled up short on the fourth step, as though the familiarity of the address surprised and somewhat shocked his dignity. Toddy Macfarlane, repeated Fettis. The London man almost staggered. He stared for the swiftest of seconds at the man before him, glanced behind him with a sort of scare, and then in a startled whisper, Fettis, he said, you. Aye, said the other, me. Did you think I was dead too? We are not so easy shut of our acquaintance. Hush, hush, exclaimed the doctor. Hush, hush, this meeting is so unexpected. I can see you are unmanned. I hardly knew you, I confess, at first. But I am overjoyed, overjoyed to have this opportunity. For the present, it must be how do you do and goodbye in one, for my fly is waiting, and I must not fail the train. But you shall, uh, let me see, yes, you shall give me your address, and you can count on early news of me. We must do something for you, Fettis. I fear you are out at elbows. But we must see to that for old Lang Syne, as once we sang at suppers. Money, cried Fettis. Money from you. The money that I had from you is lying where I cast it in the rain. Dr Macfarlane had talked himself into some measure of superiority and confidence, but the uncommon energy of this refusal cast him back into his first confusion. A horrible, ugly look came and went across his almost venerable countenance. <laughs> My dear fellow, he said, be it as you please. My last thought is to offend you. I would intrude on no one. I will leave you my address, however. I do not wish it. I do not wish to know the roof that shelters you, interrupted the other. I heard your name. I feared it might be you. I wish to know if, after all, there were a god, and know now that there is none. Be gone. He stood in the middle of the rug between the stair and the doorway, and the great London physician, in order to escape, would be forced to step to one side. It was plain that he hesitated before the thought of this humiliation. White as he was, there was a dangerous glitter in his spectacles. But while he still paused uncertain, he became aware that the driver of his fly was peering in from the street at this unusual scene, and caught a glimpse at the same time of our little body from the parlour huddled by the corner of the bar. The presence of so many witnesses decided him at once to flee. He crouched together, brushing on the wainscot, and made a dart like a serpent striking for the door but his tribulation was not yet entirely at an end, for even as he was passing, Fettis clutched him by the arm, and these words came in a whisper and yet painfully distinct. Have you seen it again? The great rich London doctor cried out aloud with a sharp throttling cry. 
He dashed his questioner across the open space and with his hands over his head fled out of the door like a detected thief. Before it had occurred to one of us to make a movement, the fly was already rattling toward the station. The scene was over like a dream, but the dream had left proofs and traces of its passage. Next day the servant found the fine gold spectacles broken on the threshold, and that very night we were all standing breathless by the barroom window, and Fetis at our side, sober, pale and resolute in look. "'God protect us, Mr Fetis,' said the landlord, coming first into possession of his customary senses. "'What in the universe is all this? These are strange things you've been saying.' Fetis turned towards us. He looked us each in succession in the face. "'See if you can hold your tongues,' said he. "'That man Macfarlane is not safe to cross. Those that have done so already have repented it too late.' And then, without so much as finishing his third glass, far less waiting for the other two, he bade us goodbye and went forth under the lamp of the hotel into the black night.' 